Hi guys, I'm Caden, and this is my team's robot for the 2017 to 2018 Vex in the Zone competition. I was the main builder of the robot, mostly due to the fact that the robot was built on the weekends when everybody else had other obligations. The main design was mine, cobbled together from ideas other teams had had, uh, and built by me and the other team members that were able to make it. I'm not going to say it was a perfect robot, it was far from it. There were major problems which I will go over at the end of the video, but I'm super proud of how this robot turned out. I do want to say though before I go on that I was not my team's driver for this season. I did drive for the footage in the video, uh, so you guys are going to get to see some of my awesome driving skills right now. This robot was made for the Vex in the Zone competition, which revolved around stacking cones on either mobile goals, which can be moved into different areas to score more points, or the high goals, which are stationary and high, as the name implies. There's also an autonomous round where you must try and score as many points in any way possible without a driver. This robot was built in less than a month to be able to score in every possible way. It could pick up and transport mobile goals, it could get between two and four cones on the high goal, and it had an autonomous that was capable of high level play. I'll talk about these more in their respective sections. Let's dive into the lift first because that's the most important and interesting thing on the robot. The lift used on the robot is a double reverse four bar. Now, this lift works on the principle that when you take two bars and mount them so that the bars are parallel, they will swivel together and always keep the end bar at the same level. This is why this lift is used so commonly. It allows you to reach great heights and still keep the instrument at the end perpendicular to the ground. The double reverse 4 bar uses two of these offset by gears, which allows them to both go up at the same time, powered by a single motor on each side. The motors are geared with a 12 to 84 ratio, which helps because the motor could not power a lift this heavy if it was driving the 84 tooth gear by itself. The gears in the middle are pretty important, and to prevent the gears from misaligning, we put two gears in the top section to ensure that the gears are always meshed properly. The top of the lift holds the cone intake, and the area in the middle near the gears holds the mobile goal intake. The one thing about this lift is that the top section folds inside the bottom section, making them cross in the middle. This is why the double reverse 4x lift is also sometimes called a bow tie lift. The rubber bands on the sides are arranged in a triangle which provides tension which helps counteract gravity. The goal of this is to place enough rubber bands to counteract gravity and help the lift rise easier, but not too many that the lift won't collapse all the way. We had four rubber band sectors on the bottom part of the DR4B, one on the inside and one on the outside on either side of the double reverse 4 bar, each sector holding 10 rubber bands. This number will change depending on a lot of factors, like whether you use the thick rubber bands or the thin ones, the weight of your lift, and the orientation of the triangle. The goal is to go from a right triangle at the bottom of the lift when it's closed to an equilateral triangle at the top when it's fully extended. Weight plays a big part of your lift, and if you can get away with using less materials, go with it. We used aluminum on the lift where we could, and steel when we didn't have that part in aluminum. It will make your life a lot easier. On the inside of each tower, we used plastic to prevent the lift from catching on the towers. We used zip ties threaded through the holes in the plastic to attach the plastic to the towers. Now let's move on to the drive. The drive is simple. Four motors going into four wheels. We had extra C-channel on the outside to ensure that the wheels would be perpendicular to the ground. The wheels were Omni wheels, which were chosen because I had heard that this put less strain on the motors in a tank drive configuration, and I figured that less strain on the motors would be a good thing. The chassis did its job, but it had some major problems. The worst thing was that it wasn't strong enough. With the lift's weight pulling on either side, the towers that connected the lift to the chassis pulled towards each other. This wouldn't have been a problem if we could put bracing between the lift towers, but because the lift collapsed through the center, we couldn't put any bracing because that would prevent the lift from lowering all the way. I wanted to place a piece of C-channel underneath to strengthen the base, but that would get stuck on the bars and we wouldn't be able to get into the 20 point zone, so we had to skip it. A lot of other teams placed their mobile goal intake in the chassis, but I was struggling trying to make one fit inside the size limit, so I had to improvise. We'll talk about that in the intake section. The wiring all fits into this cavity inside the chassis. It can be a real pain to access, but they don't get caught on anything, so that's a plus. One of the interesting things is that we used a power expander on this. This was our first robot using a power expander. This basically allowed us to use two batteries to power the robot. We had the drive and claw on the power expander, and the lift plugged directly into the cortex. The method of inserting the batteries is really neat. One of my teammates came up with it. 
It holds the batteries in place using a U-shaped piece and doesn't damage the plastic covering, which is extremely important. Now we go on to the intakes. This is our cone intake. It's a very common design called the Goliath intake, but is really great because it allows you to drop a cone relatively straight down instead of maybe having the cone get stuck on the side of a claw and come off crooked. This intake works with rubber bands on two different sprockets turning in opposite directions, essentially pulling up the cone as if it's in a tractor beam. It works surprisingly well and I'm happy with how it turned out. It wasn't an innovative design by any means, but it worked well enough. I added another motor to the side that's not connected to anything, just as a balancing agent for the lift. At one point in time we thought the lift was very unbalanced because the motor was on one side. I don't really think it helped, but I left it in there anyways. We originally tried to use a Breda design, which looked cool but didn't really add any performance benefits, and instead took much too long to fix when the rubber bands broke. You can see that these rubber bands have seen better days. The intake needed to fold up to fit within the size limit, so it needed to be able to be deployed at the beginning of the match. We couldn't use any motors for this as it would go over the 12 motor limit, but it would also take up too much space. We ended up using a rubber band wrapped around the intake and pinched between the gears so that when the intake spun, the rubber band would be free from the gears and the intake would fall down and be able to pick up cones. We couldn't figure out a way to put a mobile goal lift inside of the chassis, so we decided to put it on the back of our cone lift. This is an idea that another team had had in place in the reveal video. I didn't copy the intake screw for screw, but rather took the general idea and used it in the robot. I'll include the link to the specific video in the description. It worked extremely well. We put these small bars in the front of the lift to prevent it from getting stuck under the 10 point zone bars, which worked. My personal favorite part of this intake is the linkage I designed. I can't remember who came up with the idea, but the idea was to use the motion of the gears lifting up to tilt the intake towards the robot, letting the mobile goal slide farther into the intake. This worked beautifully. I used nylock nuts and short sections of metal to form a chain, because the VEX chain would definitely break if placed under this type of stress. The little fins on the side of the intake were to push cones out of the way during autonomous. The intake worked really well, and I'm glad we were able to put it together in time. Now let's go on to the autonomous. In VEX competitions, at the beginning of each match, there is a 15 second autonomous period where competitors must program their robot to score without driver control. Our autonomous was a fairly good one. It was capable of driving forward, capturing the mobile goal, and taking it back to the 20 point zone, behind where it had started. It drove forward, picked up the mobile goal, drove backwards before turning and driving the MOGO into the 20 point zone, letting it down and reversing to ensure that we weren't in possession of the MOGO. This worked fairly well up until the competition. If the placement was off, or if something else affected the movement, the goal would usually end up in the 10 point zone instead of the 20 point zone, or in some extreme cases, it would end up on the floor, which actually happened during a match, and there was raised fields, so that was not great. The robot was not perfect. It had some issues. The robot's motors would sometimes lock up. See, VEX motors will stop working for a short period of time if they're being used too much, and nearly all of our motors were used way too much. The cone intake would lock up and not drop cones, our lift would lock up and stop lifting, sometimes our drivetrain would even stop. I have footage of this happening a couple times, and this was the worst flaw with the robot. This was due mostly to the fact that our entire robot was steel. We barely had any aluminum, and the aluminum that we had was nearly all used up on the lift arms. This could maybe have been helped by using some different gear ratios, but by the time that we thought of that, there wasn't enough time. Even with all these flaws, I'm super happy with how things turned out. Things came together right at the last minute. This was the first year the program made it to state, and that's awesome. Thanks for watching.